Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for um, coming to our um, mapping session tonight. We have a sold out performance with Garrett Nelson of the uh, Leventhal Map Center. So um, my name is Susie Buchanan. I'm the executive director here at the Shirley Eustace House. And before I turn it over to our president, Bill Kuttner, to um, introduce Garrett, I just wanted to sort of go over a few little um, ground rules that you're probably all used to by now with respect to um, uh, Zoom. But what we're going to do is ask everybody to stay on mute during Garrett's uh, talk. If you're thinking of questions while he uh, gives his lecture, you can enter them into the chat and we'll go over them at the end. And we will take a few minutes to do the chat um, to sort of have a question and answer session at the end. And at that point, you can either feed your questions into the chat or you can also um, raise your hand uh, to ask a live question. And you'll find the, the little button to raise your hand under the little reactions menu that's in the lower right corner of your screen. Uh, I think we're good. And um, I'll just turn it over to Bill Kuttner, our president, to make formal introductions of Garrett Nelson. Good, good evening. So welcome, fellow geography and map lovers. Uh, you're in for a treat tonight. My name is Bill Kuttner. I am the president of the Shirley Uses House Association. Uh, one of the things I do as, as president, I, I love as a volunteer giving tours. And when I give a tour of our mansion, I always take people, I start by going outside and I pose a question, where are we? You know, just look around the neighborhood. Well, we are going to get a fresh look at that fresh take on that question tonight, thanks to the generous support of the Society of Cincinnati, which has sponsored this, this talk by Garrett Dash Nelson, um, titled Mapping and Placing 18th Century Roxbury in the Atlantic World. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about uh, Garrett. He is the curator of maps at the Norman Leventhal Map Center, which is located at the Boston Public Library. Uh, it was um, founded in uh, 2004, and uh, uh, Norman Leventhal collected maps his whole life. Now they're all in one place. They keep adding to them. It's only clicks away. It's a great adventure. You can download high resolution, you know, be there, be square. It's a great it's a great resource. Anyway, he's a curator of maps. Um, he joined the Norman, uh, the Leventhal Center in 2019. Uh, he, he's a graduate from Dartmouth and um, then uh, University of Wisconsin. Uh, and um, and uh, that's it. We're in for a treat. Garrett, the floor is yours. <laughs> Great, thanks Bill and thanks Susie. It's uh, really nice to be here uh, in so far as here is on a Zoom screen. Uh, I know we all wish that we were either at the Shirley Eustace House itself in Roxbury or at the Central Library where the Leventhal Map and Education Center is located. Um, just by way of a little bit of background, uh, the Leventhal Map and Education Center is a independent nonprofit that exists inside of the Boston Public Library. We care for and work with about a quarter million geographic objects. Those include maps, atlases, globes, data sets, digital humanities projects, teaching tools, education resources, and a number of other things. We have not only the collections of our founding philanthropist, Norman B. Leventhal, but also materials that the Boston Public Library has been collecting since it was founded in the mid 19th century. It's one of the largest collections of cartographic material in any library in the United States and one of the very largest in a public municipal library. And that status as being inside of a public library means that all of our programs are free and open to the public. Um, so we host not only lectures and talks and seminars, but we do workshops in GIS and map making. We have many, many programs for educators and, and students from the K-12 level to the university level. And we are really excited at the MAP Center, not just to be a storehouse of old stuff, though we certainly are that. We have some of the most important historic documents about the city of Boston and Massachusetts and New England that exist in any archive anywhere. But more importantly, we're really interested in thinking about how those maps illuminate topics that are relevant to our lives today. So we think not just about maps, but also about geography, about the relationship between people and places and how those topics are still part of our lives today. 
Another caveat by way of introduction, I am not a historian of the 18th century. Um, I am primarily trained as an urban historian of the 19th and 20th centuries. And I also, as Bill noted, started at the MAP Center in 2019, which means that by far the majority of my tenure so far has been under remote conditions. So I am the curator of a collection that I have barely been able to see in person. Uh, with that said, I am a, you know, a, a student of the city of Boston. I care very much about Boston's landscapes and neighborhoods and historical geography. And so the presentation I put together today really focuses on the Shirley Eustis house in the 18th century, but tries to pull out some broader connections about how to think about that place, uh, both where the, where the house is itself and the way that that place is kind of woven into a larger geographic tapestry of that time period. To give you a little bit of a sense of what I'm gonna talk about today, um, I'm gonna to begin with kind of situating the Shirley Eustis house in its local geography in 18th century Roxbury. And then I'm gonna think a little bit more about the geography of the world that Governor Shirley inhabited. Um, the 18th century world that tied together not only New England, but the larger British Imperial Atlantic and the conflict, world historical conflict between European empires, native peoples in North and South America and the kind of hemispheric projects um, that really shape our world in, uh, to a very large degree to this day. I'm gonna end with a little quick tour of some of the digital collections of the Leventhal Center that you are um, more than welcome to uh, explore in your own time. All of the images that I'm showing today come from our digital collections, uh, which are free and accessible online. Um, and I, I hope you all take this as a kind of promissory note to please come visit us when we do open. Uh, before you ask, we don't know when that will be yet. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any further guidance about when, uh, when the Central Library will be back in action, uh, but hopefully it will not be too many more months until you can come down to Copley Square and see these maps in person. Again, we are a free research center. Um, you can see not only our exhibitions, but anybody um, with a research card, which you can also get for free, uh, can pull and access and look at these historic documents in our reading room. So I wanna start with two big points that are gonna kind of echo through this presentation. And the first of these points is to consider how people and societies in the past had completely different conceptions of place when compared with our modern geographic categories. So we all know that people in the past spoke differently, they used different language, they wore different clothes, they had different ideas about politics, they lived in different types of houses, they used different technology. Those are all kind of familiar to us, but they also related to space in totally different ways than we do today. The, their sense of their geography and cosmography was different from ours. And by that, I mean, not only the British settlers in North America, of course, also the indigenous people of North America, French, Spanish imperial citizens, um, their worlds were not shaped by categories like Boston or Massachusetts or New England, certainly not the United States, which did not exist at all. But their way of thinking what was near and far, what was relevant to them, what was a part of their world was really different, even if they were sometimes using terms like Massachusetts that we still use today. And so I'd, kind of, I'd liken it almost to, you know, if you visit a city as a tourist for the first time, your sense of that city with, you know, in, in, that, in that first moment versus your geography, your, your personal geography of a city after you've lived in it for years and years and years. You think about how, two, how those different experiences even within a single person's life might feel in relationship between the geography that surrounds you. Stretch that out over a course of centuries, totally different political and cultural systems. And you get a sense of just how differently the people who lived in the 18th century felt about the places they lived in than we do today. The other thing I wanna emphasize throughout the talk is the way that historic maps are useful, not just for telling us where things are, were in the past. It's tempting to treat maps as mere reference objects since that's how we tend to use them in our daily lives. We wanna know where the, near, you know, where the public library is or you know, where to go for takeout food. And the map gives us that answer. Of course, historic maps do give us some answers like, you know, where was the center of Roxbury in 1740? 
but they're also useful for helping us think about what the map makers and the map readers were thinking about space. So they're not just these kind of unproblematic documents that offer a window into facts about the past, but we have to step back from the map to scrutinize who was making it, why they were making it, why they went through the difficulty of doing it, and what sorts of ideologies, power systems, means of control and of representation are embedded into those maps themselves. So I'm going to start with a very familiar map. This is a 2019 ortho photo of Roxbury and I have highlighted or outlined the Shirley Eustace house in orange. Now most of you probably know that the Shirley Eustace house was built by Governor William Shirley uh, who chose its location because it was to him a rural retreat from the politics and business that were taking place in downtown Boston. Now looking at this 2019 ortho photo, um, it may not look like uh, the neighborhood uh, that, that one would think of for a rural retreat, right? Um, certainly Roxbury is a very developed part of the city today, a very dense part of the city, a lot of heavy infrastructure, industry quite close by. And I think one of the things talking to Susie and Bill and others that they're always trying to think about with visitors is to say, this house is in uh, a neighborhood, a part of the city today that feels extraordinarily different, that is extraordinarily different, both materially, culturally, than the, the exact same spot when uh, Governor Shirley built this mansion uh, in the 1700s. So to, to give a little bit of a sense of what was different back then, you see that little blue blob in the upper right corner? That is the 1630 pre-colonial shoreline of Boston Harbor. That would have been the ocean at the time that Governor Shirley built the mansion. And as we zoom out, um, going back a few steps, you can still see the mansion highlighted in orange there. South Bay Center, of course, has that name because it was a bay. You can see just how much water covered the present day South Bay Center. And here's a larger scale view of the 1630 coastline, 1630 ocean. And there's uh, the Shirley Eustace House. You can still see it in orange in the sort of bottom left of the map there. So the the house is located in a part of the city that was on the outskirts of European colonial settlement. Boston had been settled for almost or more than a century at the time that the house was built. Uh, downtown, what we think of now as downtown Boston had developed into a fairly thriving and busy port city. Um, and Roxbury, which was an independent municipality, just like Dorchester, both of these were separate charter towns with their own colonial charters from the crown. <clears throat> they had uh, uh, agricultural uh, settlement, they had small town centers. Uh, Roxbury was to Boston today, kind of more similar to what like Southern Vermont is to Boston. Uh, uh, sorry, Roxbury in the 18th century is, was somewhat comparable to, you know, a rural place, a, a, a day's drive away from Boston where somebody might go today to site their country house, their vacation house, right? Um, it was separated from the city uh, by estuaries and bays. And so what I wanna do is to try to recreate a little bit of that world through maps and images that are in our collections. This is a picture of the Shirley Eustace house. Um, it's maybe familiar to you with that, with that cupola. Um, it's an illustration from 1776 that appeared in a volume of maps called the Atlantic Neptune. Now the Atlantic Neptune was one of the great cartography projects of the British empire. It was commissioned by the Lord's Admiralty of the British Navy. And it was extraordinarily difficult, extraordinarily expensive and extraordinarily scientifically advanced for its time. The Atlantic Neptune charted the Atlantic coast all the way from present day Canada into the Caribbean. And in each of its plates, again, you can come see Atlantic Neptune plates at the map center, each of its plates, it gave detail about the cities, the views, the sorts of things that you would see in the um, Atlantic British Empire. So just, uh, this is another plate from the Atlantic Neptune, not the one where that illustration of the Shirley Eustace house is, uh, appears, but this is the Boston Harbor plate of the Atlantic Neptune. And what 
the, the cartographer is chiefly responsible for Atlantic Neptune, a guy named JFW Debar. What he had to do was to collect an ex extraordinary amount of geographic information. This is, a, this is an inset of uh, Boston Harbor. There's Castle Island at the bottom center here. All of these soundings and sight lines were meant to aid the British in their imperial administration of this territory. This was produced, um, it was completed in, just at the outbreak of the American Revolutionary War. So it was made at a time that the British were very concerned about their imperial control, particularly of harbors and coasts. And as you can see in this, uh, this Boston map, it was primarily a nautical uh, operation. So it didn't contain very much detail about uh, inland because it was meant for ship captains. But it did include a few of these kind of picturesque sketches, which were very much a part. The relationship between cartography and um, field sketching was, uh, was, was very close during the British Empire. And these, these types of materials were sent back to England as a way of depicting these far-flung parts of the empire. So this is, a, this is the whole plate um, that, that I had just showed you the, the inset of uh, a second ago. There's the Shirley House. And this is probably the best picture uh, that we have, the best illustration that we have of what the landscape, what the geography around the Shirley House looked like in the 18th century. Now this is 1770s, so this is after Governor Shirley has departed Boston, um, but it's not, it, the, the way the landscape appears is not that different from what it would have been 20 or 30 years prior. Just to orient you in this image, that's the Shirley House, this Boston Neck, which is Washington Street today, there's Beacon Hill, uh, what the English call the Tri-Mountain. There's Dock Square, Faneuil Hall, that was the main port. That's where uh, basically the foot of the, the, the wharves were located. There's South Bay, now a shopping plaza, a parking lot. And here's Dorchester Heights. Now that was the northernmost part of the independent town of Dorchester, which we now call South Boston today. So South Boston High School is located at the highest part of Dorchester Heights. And just to kind of map that on or relate that to what this landscape looks like today, this is the best, this is the closest I could get to the same uh, perspective from that day bar, Atlantic Neptune. Again, there's the Shirley House, there's Boston Neck, there's Beacon Hill, there's Dock Square, there's the South Bay Center, and there's Dorchester Heights. So it looks quite different uh, from the 19th century to the beginning of the 21st. And it's not just that it looked different, but there was radically different the, the, the ways that people got around, the way these towns were related to one another. Again, Roxbury, Dorchester were not parts of the city of Boston. They were independent towns in their own right. They were not annexed to the city um, for a century more. Um, so they would have felt like different places, right? And that, that, that imagination of what felt like different places that felt like same places. The Shirley Eustace House feels like part of Boston today, but it would not have felt like quote unquote part of Boston at the time that the house was built. This is another image that kind of gives us a sense of the relationship of that landscape to Boston. This is from a really interesting set of watercolor field sketches that was done by a, a British officer named Richard Williams in 1775 when the British were occupying Boston. And he stood at the top of Beacon Hill and, and uh, sketched out uh, this actually panoramic view. And uh, our colleagues at the Mount, uh, Washington Library at Mount Vernon have actually turned this into a panorama that you can, you can kind of go around in virtual reality. So uh, Williams is looking from Beacon Hill here um, in the direction of Roxbury. And I've circled here essentially where the Shirley Eustace house uh, was at the time. You know, it existed in 1775. You couldn't see far enough to actually sketch it into this, uh, into this image. But to relate this actually now to the map, how do I know that that is where the Shirley Eustace house is? Well, we're, I'm gonna switch over and then I'm gonna come back to that image. This is the Pella map produced in 1777. It's by far the most important and detailed map of Boston at the time of the American Revolutionary War. And it does show where the Shirley house is. It labels it Governor Shirley. You can see it here, we're zoomed all the way in as close as possible. Um, this image is actually a, a copy that uh, is at the, uh, one of our digital partner collections, the Washington Library of Mount Vernon. We also have a copy of the Pelham map. Our scan of it is just not quite as good. So, so I'd like to use this one that's a bit higher resolution. So zooming out, you can see Governor Shirley is still in the center of the, of the image right here. 
And now we see how it's related, the house was related to Roxbury. So this was downtown Roxbury, quote unquote, this is the center of Roxbury. This Roxbury meeting house is right here. You can see the fortifications and this map was made in 1777. And here's the whole Pelham map um, showing Boston. And if we draw a line between Beacon Hill where Richard Williams was standing and the Shirley house, that's that line. The circle is Beacon Hill, the arrow is pointing at the Shirley house. There's a couple of things that lie kind of along that line. And it's basically dead straight along the block house that, that um, fortified Boston Neck. The fortifications, the advanced fortifications of, of, uh, in Roxbury are just to the right of that line. Um, and you can see there's a little hummock called Pine Island that's just to the left of that, that view line. So again, here's, uh, here's that same view. That's Pine Island right here, this little, this little hummock in the salt flats. These are uh, the fortification, or th this is the block house on the neck, and then these are the fortifications in Lower Roxbury. So basically that means that we're looking right about here to where the, the Shirley House mansion would have been. And again, this is you know another depiction of just how far away it would have seemed at the time, right? It's, it's across the bay. The neck is the only way in and out of Boston uh, if you're not on a boat. Uh, the tidal flats were essentially uncrossable. Uh, you know, we still have tidal flats like these in other parts of Massachusetts, like Ipswich. Um, those are the best. If you've seen those tidal flats, um, you can imagine a little bit what what um, South Bay and the Back Bay looked like at that time. So, you know, to get there was, uh, it was really a rural retreat. We're also uh, kind of lucky in terms of uh, cartographic material relating to uh, the, the house because it was on a border. It was very close to the border between Bo uh, Roxbury and Dorchester. We actually don't have great uh, 18th century uh, maps of Roxbury at the town scale. Most of the maps that were being produced at this time were either at Boston, which was the port city, um, or else are at the larger scale of Massachusetts or New England. Um, but just after American independence, the new state of Massachusetts actually ordered every town to commission a survey of its boundaries in 1794. Uh, Drake in his, uh, uh, Francis Drake, the less famous Francis Drake, uh, wrote the, uh, an 1898 history of the town of Roxbury and notes that the, the Shirley Eustace house, uh, just to its east side, ran the brook forming the boundary between D Roxbury and Dorchester, which by 1898 was already flowing through a sewer. And he has a little bit of kind of landscape detail about it. a magnificent willow was at the westerly edge of a small pond. Um, these are the, uh, these three images show the 1794 boundary plans for on the left, Boston, um, in the middle, that's the plan of Roxbury, and on the right, that's the plan of Dorchester. And because the uh, Eustace house is pretty close to all three of these borders, um, we don't actually see the house itself, but we can see the creek um, that ran, or, or the brook that ran up from uh, into South Bay that uh, is described by Drake here that ran just to the east side of the of the Shirley house. And so that's it in the in the Boston plan. Here it is. Here's that brook in the Roxbury plan. This is the road running from between Roxbury and Dorchester on which the Shirley house sat, sit, still sits. <laughs> um, and then this is the same uh, shown from the Dorchester side. Uh, you can see this uh, lower road here was basically located where this lower road between Dorchester and Roxbury crossed this brook um, running into South Bay. And as a point of reference for today's geography, that brook is basically where the then uh, Norfolk Railroad dropped its uh, branch line coming into the city. That railroad is the Fairmount commuter line today. It's still railroads are one of the things that don't move very much throughout history. And so this rail line, uh, you know it today, is the Fairmount Branch. This is the South Bay. Uh, this is South the South Bay, now the South Bay Center. So this is essentially where the Newmarket train stop is. And the Shirley House would have been right here. Um, this is Norfolk Street um, going between Roxbury and Dorchester. And the Shirley House would have, it's not shown on this map. But you can see here, like, it was basically just at the highest point 
um, where this ester and marsh became kind of solid ground. So Shirley had built this mansion on this, you know, nice kind of brook becoming salt marsh flowing into the ocean, the type of place where, you know, million dollar homes are built in places like, you know, Ipswich or the South Shore today. Um, so, you know, we're still attracted, you still have kind of elite landscapes on these same types of places uh, many centuries later. But of course, what's not shown on these maps is just as important as what is shown on these maps. And surely a uh, colonial administrator of the British Empire was thinking and operating in a world that was much, much larger than Roxbury itself, which is why it's really useful to kind of zoom out and um, think a little bit more about the regional relationships between Roxbury and other parts of both the British Atlantic and the many other peoples and societies and empires that were vying for power at this time. I really like this map. Um, oh, whoops, I've captioned it incorrectly. It's not 1820, it's circa 1720. So that's a typo on my part. Um, There's a French map, um, but I, I, I quite like maps that have north um, not at the top, if only because they visually invite us into thinking about space in a slightly different way than the one that we're familiar with. And of course, uh, uh, the maritime empires of Britain and France that were reaching uh, what we now call New England from this perspective, this is kind of how they would have seen it, right? They didn't, north up is just a, uh, an arbitrary cartographic convention. So this larger region, this larger coastal region stretching from the originally Dutch colony at uh, New Amsterdam and New York um, up uh, the Long Island Sound through Connecticut, the Plymouth Plantation, which by this time had been merged into Massachusetts. Um, and then a couple of things to note on this map, which is actually a French ripoff of uh, one of the earliest British uh, English maps of, of New England. Uh, but the French added a couple of embellishments, which are, which are interesting to point out. First, they, you know, you, we can see Roxbury here. So here's Boston and there's Roxbury and Dorchester uh, just outside of it. They're basically the nearest suburbs, um, though that term was certainly not in use in the 18th century in the way we think of it today. Actually, the term suburb um, was coming into use, but mostly as a pejorative, the term suburb for a long time meant like something that was substandard, sub suburban. Um, so Roxbury and Dorchester, their identity was as agricultural towns, not as dormitory suburbs, and certainly not as neighborhoods of the city of Boston, the way we think of them today. There's also a couple of things to, else to note on this map. One is that the word New England is not here. Instead, this whole area is labeled the province, Provence de Boston, for the province of Boston. That was very common at this time to refer to kind of greater New England as Boston. That relationship between Boston as a city and the larger regional uh, polity of New England is really well documented in Mark Peterson's new book called The City State of Boston, um, very much recommended. It's also chock full of maps from the map center. Um, but Boston meant both the kind of political capital that lay on the small tide island uh, that connected to mainland by Boston Neck, as well as this larger system of um, English colonization that was driven by a particular type of English colonists, right? So you know, the, we think of you know, the English colonies as eventually becoming the United States, but in fact, different types of English people <laughs> settled in different parts of the uh, North American seaboard. And the uh, Puritan exiles uh, who founded Boston and founded Massachusetts Bay Colony really did have a uh, kind of interesting relationship between these nucleated settlements in places like Boston and Roxbury, and then this larger trade network very focused around maritime trade. You'll also notice that the coast is hugely important here, right? So for people living in Boston and Roxbury of the 18th century, Long Island was much closer to them, conceptually closer to them than let's say uh, like where Worcester is today. Um, it was much more difficult to travel inland. And now we think of you know Worcester and Boston almost as like being part of the same city. They've grown together so closely, their train ride away. 
But it was really this colonial frontier of settlement uh, that tied together the English empire in North America. What was behind or beyond that colonial settlement, of course, shown on this map as this, this riot of, uh, of trees and kind of sketchy guesses about where things were going. The French actually um, gave credit to uh, something that is left off of all of the maps that I've showed you so far, which is that this was a place where people already lived long before any European set foot in North America. And so you see here the term pay ou les Abenaki chants. That's French for the, the land, the country where the Abenakis hunt. And this entire New England uplands, even in the 1720s, middle of the 18th century, was still inhabited. In fact, there are still descendants of Abenakis who live in New England today, hundreds of years later. But this was a colonial contact zone. It was a place where the English uh, empire was struggling to define its relationship um, with native peoples and usually not in a particularly cooperative way. Uh, Prince Philip's War with the Indian Sage of Metacomet had, you know, still to this day, it was the most violent and bloody uh, conflict in U.S. history in terms of the fraction of people who were killed. Um, New England was nearly wiped out. Br British New England was nearly wiped out at that time. But the English had a complicated relationship. The American Indians were trading partners. They were guides. They were certainly sources of cartographic information. And so a map like this one is at least, a, at the very least, a reminder that this was not some sort of undifferentiated English province, but rather a really fraught contact zone between radically different forms of territorial settlement, between cultural practices, uh, and between people who essentially uh, were prosecuting uh, outright warfare against each other, in the, in the case of the British, a genocidal war of removing people and expropriating their land. You see that in other places. Um, this is a map that was produced right in the middle of Governor Shirley's time in Massachusetts by an important cartographer of the time called Thomas Jeffries. Uh, it's a map of the in most inhabited part of New England. And in this, which uh, we call the cartouche in map making, it's this sort of decorative uh, place where you find the, the title and sometimes the legend and other information. You can see this vignette of colonial contact with uh, this kind of stylized Puritans uh, meeting and shaking hands uh, with a native person while the figure of liberty with the Phrygian cap uh, here uh, on the stick is sort of beckoning the way into uh, the new world um, as people unload things from, from ships. Um, so a kind of poignant sense of how the English uh, saw themselves as, you know, both uh, kind of meeting and contacting native peoples and then preparing essentially to resettle the land in their own image. The same map in 1755, here we're looking, uh, this is the Connecticut River. So today's Vermont on the left and today's New Hampshire on the right. Um, but notice it's labeled uh, the wilderness lands of the crown which have not yet been appropriated. So the British crown essentially said these lands are ours now and we're not gonna put settlers on them until we parcel them out into towns and we assign them to town corporations. And actually here uh, in, in New Hampshire, uh, this is you know, about where US Route 4 is in New Hampshire. Um, this is Lake Sunapee. Uh, they had laid out a double line of towns for a frontier against the Indians. Um, this is actually the fort at number four, which you can still visit today as a historic site. Um, this is not very far from in, in, you know, as the crow flies in miles from Governor Shirley's Boston. Um, but it is, uh, it shows the way that the interior, the land, uh, the upland interior of New England was still a very active both war zone as well as a place where the English were trying to map. They were trying to prepare land for sale. They were trying to measure and assign essentially English title in this land. And so that contact was driven both by map makers, right? The process of regularizing and normalizing inland settlement for sale um, and the process of erasing uh, indigenous presence, indigenous claims to land off of the map in, in a title like 
wilderness lands of the crowd, not yet appropriated. And even that, 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 that phrase is so suggestive, right? They're just waiting to be appropriated. Like they're empty until the crown says, we've made a town here, we've assigned the town to a corporation. And that, that work is what Governor Shirley was doing, right? As, a, as an appointee of the crown in New England, um, as essentially, essentially had the power of the Massachusetts Bay Colony to extend uh, the colonial frontier, to assign towns. Uh, Massachusetts was much more <clears throat> incorporated uh, than New Hampshire was at this time. And still that process was very much actively go ongoing at this time. And of course that meant contact in other ways too. Governor Shirley um, famously prosecuted um, uh, the, war, the, uh, the wars, um, both against the French empire, but those wars against the French empire were fought with uh, native, um, native peoples as uh, both everything from soldiers to messengers to very importantly, um, essentially inf information for cartographers. So native knowledge about the inland landscape was a hugely important factor in fighting um, what we now call the French and Indian War um, and the Seven Years War. <clears throat> and this is an illustration of a bat the battle near Lake George um, and it is dedicated. Uh, unfortunately, our copy of this map is a little bit frayed but it is dedicated to His Excellency William Shirley Esquire. So uh, a figure like Shirley, of course, is, a, is, um, is essentially a patron of the cartographic arts at this time, right? Maps, drawings, illustrations, things like this are being sent back and dedicated to him because they establish what happened, what was going on. They give information about these conflicts um, and they aid in the process of administration, right? Maps and territorial administration are tied to each other throughout history. The ability to make a map about a territory gives you the information that you need to have in order to govern that territory. And surely as the uh, colonial governor <clears throat> needed that information more than anyone. Now, of course, Shirley's uh, perhaps even more famous escapade was in, uh, into the French Atlantic at, um, at the time in the 1740s. And again, turning back to the sense of uh, kind of maritime occupation, how people would have um, related themselves to a larger geography you know, you, those of you who live in Boston may not think of Nova Scotia or Cape Breton Island as particularly close to you, but Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia, <clears throat> the, these parts of the British French imperial contact zone were very, very close to in the, in the minds of people like William Shirley. They were part of this extended um, imperial system. And of course, the national border between the United States and Canada did not exist at this time. That did not mean anything. You know, that you, know, you go to Nova Scotia and now you're in Canada. At the time, you were just in another part of the colonial frontier where the British and the French were vying for power. <clears throat> Charles Morris produced this map dedicated to His Excellency William Shirley in 1749. And a map like this would have been used by Shirley to plan the famous expedition to Lewisburg, where he brought New England soldiers essentially on commission uh, so, so as soldiers of fortune to invade the French stronghold at Lewisburg. And you know, again, this map, th this map basically shows William Shirley's world, right? Stretching from New York to Cape Breton Island and even to, uh, even to what's today Newfoundland. Um, this larger uh, maritime zone from Long Island Sound to the Bay of Fundy and beyond Prince Edward Island. Um, this was tied together by a system of trade, by colonial relationships and by military power as well. And so William Shirley in the 1740s um, uh, sends New England troops to capture Lewisburg. They're doing it both by drawing on, you know, they're, they're spying on the French, they're, they're stealing cartographic information from the French. Um, this is a map of, of Lewisburg Harbor um, that uh, was is actually in the British Library in the, um, in the collections of King George III. Um, there's a whole set of, of um, uh, King uh, royal collections of the maps that the, the British crown was using to prosecute their imperial wars at this time. And this map sketched uh, basically at, this, the, at the time that the, um, the New England um, martial forces were, were, were 
going to war in Lewisburg. We're, we're, we're committing this raid on Lewisburg. It's an interesting document. This was later owned by um, Lord Jeffrey Amherst. Um, it, the, that, that attack on Lewisburg set off a whole series of other kind of British speculations that would end up uh, conclude. It was not the sole cause of the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, um, but it was certainly one of the uh, uh, one of the events that kind of moved forward this larger British, both cartographic and political imagining of what they could do in the French Atlantic world. Now that world stretched south as well as north. Uh, of course, William Shirley becomes governor of the Bahamas after he leaves Massachusetts in the 1750s. Um, this map also by Thomas Jeffries, I showed you a Jeffries map earlier. This is a map of uh, the title is actually in French, the Paisades, the ceded territories or ceded land, ceded, ceded provinces um, of East Florida. Uh, East Florida was ceded to this, uh, by the Spanish to the English after the uh, Seven Years' War. Um, and here are the Bahamas. So these, this was another piece of this far flung British empire. Um, again, the Bahamas today is a different country. You need a passport to go to the Bahamas. It seems far away, but you know, the trajectory, the itineraries of somebody like William Shirley are a reminder of how much closer in some ways these were connected into a single system than perhaps we might think of them today. So I'm gonna close it there with this whirlwind trip at a variety of scales through maps that kind of open up William Shirley's world and how Roxbury was related to this larger Atlantic system in the 18th century. I do want to show two other things that um, hopefully invite you to explore our maps and to um, uh, and to use our resources even well, as I said, we're not yet open. Everything I've showed you in this uh, uh, slideshow is all taken directly out of our digital collections portal. Um, you can read more about our digital collections and all of our collections um, at leventhalmap.org slash collections. We have about just over 10,000 maps that are digitized and freely available as high resolution images. Now, remember, we do have a quarter million maps. So even though 10,000 or so of the best maps have been digitized, there's still many, many things that are in our collections um, that you'll have to come and visit us for if you'd like to access. Um, but we do have, uh, uh, especially for this period, especially for 18th and <clears throat> 18th century and Revolutionary War periods, um, most of the most important maps have been digitized. I also want to take you on a quick little tour of a tool that we built that is not particularly useful for thinking about the 18th century, but it does show a little bit about what happened to the Shirley House um, in the years after uh, it was built. And that is a, a tool we built called Atlascope, which um, involved uh, digitally transforming about 100 atlases from the late 19th and early 20th centuries of Boston. <laughs> that show an incredible amount of detail about buildings and property owners. Um, I'm actually going to take you on a quick, I think we have time. Yeah, uh, I was saving this to see if we had time. And I think I'll, I'll make it a very quick little test drive of Atlascope, but we will take a look at what became of the, uh, of the Shirley House uh, over the, uh, the chronology that's shown in Atlascope, which again is, is, is quite a bit after the 18th century. This is a great tool to use if you want to research the history of your house or small scale landscapes, neighborhoods uh, in other parts of Boston. I'm going to search for Shirley Eustace House on 33 Shirley Street. It'll take me right there. <clears throat> and so you can see here's a modern, uh, here's a modern map of Boston. Um, there's Dudley Street, there's George Street, Clifton Street, and there's the Shirley Eustace House um, right there. And as you kind of pan this lens back and forth, we can see through to historic atlases that have been transposed so that they are dropped down in exactly the right position. We're looking at 1873 right here uh, when the house was owned by W.E. Woodward. Uh, and we can actually scroll through uh, quite a few different years of history here. I'm not going to do all of them because there's a lot of them. We're also right on the edge of Roxbury and Dorchester, which means that some of these map these are physical atlases and they tended to be 
categorized by um, neighborhoods. So you can see we're actually right on the edge of the Roxbury map here. Though in 1873, remember that brook uh, that led down to the South Bay? You can see in 1873, it's still there. It's still just east of the house. And there it is running. Um, you can actually see its old course here. And then it got ditched. You can see that label ditch. Um, <clears throat> there's the railroad. It's channelized here, this Clapp Street, and then here's uh, the South Bay, um, which was starting to be filled in and developed uh, in the 1870s. So you can actually see this crazy mishmash of planned neighborhoods and roads overlapping the historic shoreline of, of South Bay still in 1873. But uh, zooming back over here, the, the Shirley House, there's 1873. I'm just gonna jump through a couple of, here's 1882. 1880, oh, that's a, that's a uh, Dorchester map, so it's not on it. In 1884, it was owned by a woman named Hannah Osgood. It's actually quite interesting to see there's quite a few um, women owners of property that appear in Atlascope. Then we'll jump a little further. 1915, it's owned by the Shirley Eustis House Association, has, has purchased it. Um, and so they are the owners by 1915, uh, Eustis House Association, you can actually see. Uh, that's kind of a cool little bit of, of history. And then um, jumping up to 1933, Shirley Place, still owned by the Eustis House Association. But you can actually see how during that period, all of these uh, triple deckers and apartment houses and other buildings filled in the neighborhood around it. So this is not, a, I've taken a step out of 18th century history, but I did just want to show off Atlascope, um, not only because it shows the Shirley Eustis House Association buying this historic property, um, but also because it's a great research tool for other parts of Boston. So uh, I'll just switch back over the screen share for a second um, uh, because it has our, our leventhalmap.org uh, URL. Uh, this is a, a great 1898 photo of the, of the Shirley House um, from the BPL's photographic archives. But um, I know we have time for questions. I'm happy to talk about whatever topics. Uh, if it, you go too far into my <laughs> the limits of my 18th century knowledge, I will not be afraid to admit that I don't know the answer. Um, I'm also more than happy to follow up after the talk. Um, so on this slide, you have my email address um, and my Twitter handle if you want to reach me there. You can also follow the MAP Center on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram at BPL Maps. Um, we post essentially every day interesting stuff um, from the 18th century to the 21st century. Um, and we'd love to know what you think. So I'll leave it there. I know that Susie and Bill are going to moderate the discussion a little bit, but you can use your raise hand button, which is under reactions on your Zoom screen, uh, or you can type a question in the chat and we'll try to get to it. <clears throat> 